In this lecture, we will cover simple linear regression, which is part of the larger regression family of analyses. We'll start with an overview of what simple linear regression is, we'll go over the statistical assumptions underlying simple linear regression, and we'll talk about statistical and practical significance in the context of simple linear regression. So let's start with that overview. So in terms of simple linear regression, as I mentioned before, it's part of the larger regression family of analyses, which are a very powerful and broad set of different inferential statistics that we might use. Now, in this lecture, we're going to focus specifically on simple linear regression, but I'll also note there's also multiple linear regression, as well as a number of other forms of regression that you might use. But simple linear regression is the starting point. This is where we should start in trying to understand what regression actually is. So, in terms of simple linear regression, what we're talking about is a linear relationship, specifically a linear bivariate relationship, where bivariate means between two variables. So this is a relationship between two different variables, and we're interested in whether or not a linear relationship exists between them, and if so, in what direction is that relationship, and what is the strength of that relationship as well. And so if we look at this scatter plot here, we can see variable x, which is what we can call our predictor variable, and variable y, which is what we can call our outcome variable. And so here, if you visualize this scatter plot, you can see that these different dots here represent individual unique cases, where a case might be employee scores. So each circle represents an employee score on the x variable and on the y variable, where x again refers to the predictor variable and y as the outcome variable in this scenario. And as you can see, there appears to be somewhat of an upward trend in terms of how these, these different circles are scattered about here. Now, part of what regression is, and specifically simple linear regression, is finding that line of best fit that best represents the data here while minimizing the errors around that line. So ideally, we want that line to be as close as possible to all those different circles or dots that you see there. And so, what we want to minimize, in other words, is the residual or the error variance, sometimes just called the residuals, between each person or each case and that line of best fit. So if this was a perfect linear relationship, we would see that all of those different dots or circles were perfectly lined up in a straight line, and that red line would completely superimpose over them, nearly blocking them out. Now, in this case, we can see that there isn't perfect prediction here. There are errors, which is to be expected, especially when working with human data here. And so, again, these are called your residual errors or simply your residuals. And we represent those by little e in the equation. Now, you'll see here that where the red line, which is our line of best fit, crosses that y-axis, this is what we refer to as the intercept value. And we represent that using the beta sub zero. And so beta here is just that capital B letter that you see. Sometimes you'll see it represented as a lowercase b when we're talking about unstandardized regression coefficients. And so again, where the line of best fit crosses that y-axis, this is our intercept value. Now, when we're talking about the slope or the direction of the line, this is where the rise into run come into play that you might have learned earlier, perhaps in high school or even middle school. And so this is commonly represented by beta as well. So you also have, and those are regression coefficients, and this is a slope value. So it's the rise over the run. And so in this case, we can see that the slope is positive in nature. And maybe in another relationship, we would see that it's negative in, in nature. So in this case, we can see that as values of x increase, values in y tend to increase as well. Now, a big question comes that we'll answer a little bit later is, well, is this line, is this slope statistically significantly different from zero? And so that's where practice, or that's when st statistical significance comes into play. So in this case that I was showing you, we were focusing on what are referred to as unstandardized regression coefficients. And as I mentioned, we commonly represent those using either a capital B, which stands for beta, or we can use a lowercase b. So you'll sometimes see those used interchangeably. Now, if you're seeing a standardized regression coefficient, those are usually represented by the Greek letter beta, which you'll see below in parentheses there. And so typically, if we want to interpret the variables and the relationships, in the original scale of those variables, we use unstandardized regression coefficients. And so understand unstandardized regression coefficients indicate the raw slope, or rather how much a one unit increase in the predictor results in a unit change in the outcome. 
And so the unstandardized regression coefficients will also include that y-intercept value. Now, if you're working with a standardized regression coefficient, because it's been standardized, there's really no y-intercept value. In other words, the y-intercept value is just simply zero. But a standardized regression coefficient indicates the standardized slope, or rather how much a one standardized unit increase in the predictor results in standardized unit change in the outcome variable. And again, when we're looking just at standardized regression coefficients as part of an estimated model, the intercept value will be equal to zero, so we usually ignore that. Now, when I say one standardized unit increase, what I mean is one standard deviation increase, unit increase in the predictor variable relative to the outcome variable. Okay? And so again, we're, I would recommend using unstandardized regression coefficients for the most part because you do get more information there. It is in the original raw scaling of both the predictor and the outcome variable, so a little bit more directly interpretable. So let's talk about the statistical assumptions underlying simple linear regression. So the assumptions of simple linear regression are as follows. First, and this is a hard one to really demonstrate, but it's something that's important to consider, is that the cases are randomly sampled from the underlying population. Now, unless we use a random sampling technique or a probability sampling technique, we're not gonna really know whether or not this happened. We just wanna make sure that there's not any clustering or nesting of the data. Now, if we suspect that, there's other types of regression analyses that we might wanna use, such as hierarchical linear modeling, or in other words, multi-level regression. Now, the second assumption is that the data are free of bivariate outliers. So we wanna make sure that there's no one that's really, no case that's standing out as being very different from the others, because those cases that stand out as bivariate outliers can actually really wreak havoc on the estimation of that line of best fit. Now, in addition, in terms of the third assumption, we, we wanna make sure that the association between the predictor and the outcome variables is linear. After all, this is called simple linear regression. There's other approaches we can use within this framework if we're trying to test for quadratic or cubic or other nonlinear relationships. But in this context, we're interested in a linear relationship, and that's why that regression equation I showed you a little bit ago is the equation for a line. Now, we also want to make sure that the variables demonstrate a bivariate normal distribution. So one way you can see that is by seeing that classic ellipse or football shape. And we also want to meet the assumption that the average residual error value is zero for each level of the predictor variable. In addition, we want to make sure that the variances of those residual errors e are equal for all levels of the predictor variable. And this is sometimes referred to as meeting the assumption of homoscedasticity. If you don't meet that assumption of homoscedasticity, then you would be in a situation that's called heteroscedasticity. And that's something that would violate that assumption. Now, some deviations from these are acceptable. We just don't want to make, we want to make sure things aren't overtly or uh, very severe. Now, the final assumption is that the residual errors are normally distributed for each level of that predictor variable. So again, these are the assumptions that need to be met before actually running a simple linear regression. If you don't mean these assumptions, you'll run into interpretation issues and things like that that can affect the accuracy of the inferences that you make based on the data. Now, let's talk about statistical significance in the context of a simple linear regression model. So, if we're using null hypothesis significance testing, and let's assume for the sake of explanation that we've set the alpha value as a 0.05, which is pretty conventional, and it's a two-tailed test. Now, if we can meet that standard for statistical significance, if we reject the null hypothesis that a regression coefficient is equal to zero. In other words, we're concluding that that regression coefficient does not seem to be equal to zero, and for that reason, it's significantly different from zero. And so we would conclude that we would reject the null hypothesis if our p-value is less than that alpha level of 0.05. So again, a very conventional standpoint from that regard. Now, the next thing is if we're talking about failing to reject the null hypothesis, this would be situations in which we find that that p-value associated with the regression coefficient is equal to or greater than our alpha level, which here we set as 0.05. And so if we fail to reject the null hypothesis, we're essentially failing to conclude that that particular regression coefficient, which is another word for the slope, is, any, is even different from zero. In other words, we can't conclude that it's different from zero. And so in other words, we have not found that there's any directional relationship here.
Now, in addition, we can also use confidence intervals as well. And if our, let's say, 95% confidence interval does not include zero, then we would also conclude that we have met the standard for statistical significance. So in the context of simple linear regression, we're trying to determine whether or not our slope or regression coefficient is statistically different from zero. Now, in addition, we want to look at the direction too. Is it positive or negative? Because that's going to aid in our interpretation as well. Now, you might be asking yourself, well, isn't the intercept value, if we're talking about an unstandardized regression model, isn't that also a regression coefficient? And the answer is yes, but we're not often interested in that intercept value. And so even though there's a p-value that's associated with that, in other words, a test of statistical significance, that's not often something that we're really interested in interpreting. So we usually jump right to the regression coefficient, or in other words, the slope, because that's usually where the meaningful relationship is that we wish to test. Now, it's not always that case, but at least in most contexts within HR analytics, that will be the case. So let's talk about some examples of statistical significance in the context of regression. And specifically, let's assume that these are unstandardized regression coefficients here, represented as capital B sub predictor. Now, let's assume a two-tailed alpha of 0.05, which means that the p-value needs to be less than 0.05 to be considered statistically significant. If it is equal to or greater than 0.05, then we would conclude that it is not statistically significant. And so let's look at that first B sub predictor that we see, the regression coefficient or slope, equal to negative 1.42. We see the associated p-value here is equal to 0.01, which is less than that alpha level, that cutoff of 0.05. So in this context, we would conclude that the regression coefficient or the regression slope is statistically significantly different from zero. And what's more, we can see that we have a negative sign here. And so what this means is that for every one unit increase in our predictor variable, we see a 1.42 unit decrease in our outcome variable. And that's all in the original scaling of that variable. So we can, we can conclude here that there is some kind of relationship here. Now, Let's look at this second example here. And here we see that the B sub predictor or the regression coefficient for the predictor variable, in other words, the slope is equal to 0.11. And we see the p-value here is 0.06. That is greater than 0.05. So the regression coefficient is not statistically significantly different from zero in this context. So now let's move on to the effect size and practical significance that we need to consider in the context of simple linear regression. Now remember, Classically, we're going to want to demonstrate statistical significance before we go and interpret the effect size or whether there's any practical significance of a particular relationship. So an unstandardized regression coefficient, it's important to note, is not an effect size. So when you see that B value or the lowercase or uppercase, that's not an effect size. It's not standardized. And even if you go down the road of using a standardized regression coefficient, which is represented by that Greek letter beta, I really caution you about trying to interpret that as an effect size, even though it's standardized. And the reason is because when we get into multiple linear regression, we have more than one predictor variables in our model. There's some issue in terms of partialing out the variance, and it's hard to really know what the true size of that relationship. In most cases, what we really want to know is we just want to know the bivariate relationship between variable X and variable Y, or between this predictor and this outcome variable, what the actual magnitude of that relationship is. In other words, the effect size. And if we want an answer to that question, we can just run a simple correlation, specifically a Pearson product moment correlation if we're talking about two continuous variables. And then we can use this as an effect size. Now, some statistical platforms will actually pump out a correlation coefficient or matrix as part of the output. Others, you might have to request this separately. But I'd advise you, if you're really just interested in the practical significance or the effect size of that a particular regression coefficient, just take the extra step of running a Pearson product moment correlation. Now, in addition, when we do run a correlation, we can reflect back on some of Cohen's rules of thumb for how to qualitatively describe effect sizes. And if you recall those for a correlation coefficient, a small correlation is about r equal to 0 0.10, a medium is about r equal to 0 0.30, and a large is about r equals to 0 0.50. Now, it's important to point out here, too, that these can be both positive or negative. So just ignore the sign of being positive or negative when you're interpreting the magnitude of a particular effect. 
Now, alternatively, with a simple linear regression model, we can also directly interpret the R squared value for the model, which is a fit statistic um, and an effect size that will come standard in most output for statistical software platforms. And so R squared is an estimate of variance explained as well as a fit statistic. And so R squared is a model fit statistic and an effect size that can be interpreted as the proportion or percentage of variance explained in an outcome variable by a predictor variable. If we're talking about the context of simple linear regression, the interpretation changes a bit once you get to multiple linear regression and you have more than one predictor variables. So in terms of describing effect sizes for R squared qualitatively, a small would be about 0.01, a medium about 0.09, and a large would be 0.25. So a large of 0.25 means that the predictor variable explains 25% of the variability in the outcome variable. So that might not sound like a lot, but that's doing pretty well in a human context, in an HR context. We get pretty excited about that. In fact, we might get excited about some variance explained or R squared values that are around 0.05 or even 0.01 in some context. But again, make sure that the relationship is first statistically significant before you go on to interpret the effect size or practical significance. So let's think a little bit more conceptually about what this R squared value means. And so you can think of it as total variance explained as another way of thinking of it. So let's look at this conceptual space here that represents outcome variable Y. And if we overlap this with predictor variable X, that shared overlap place where you have the relevance there, so that conceptual overlap between your predictor variable and outcome variable, you can think of this as being the proportion or the percentage of variance explained. If these two circles perfectly overlapped with each other, that would be an R squared value of 1.00. Or in other words, you could think of that as 100% of the variability in the outcome variable is explained by the predictor variable. Now here we can see that let's estimate that at being 25% or maybe 30% of the variance of the outcome variable is explained by the predictor variable. But again, this is a nice way to conceptually think about what does that mean when we're talking about variance explained? So in this lecture, we talked about what simple linear regression actually means and what the statistical assumptions are for simple linear regression. And then we talked about statistical significance and practical significance specifically in the context of simple linear regression. And so this wraps up the lecture on simple linear regression.